<laughs> now, another little saying, because I just love these. Now, let's think about, though, the absolute poorest of the poor in Victorian England. You might not have even had a place to rest your head. And if you had spent your money at the local pub and, you know, was feeling a little worse for wear, you might end up at some place, some place called a two penny hangover. And you, it was mm. literally a rope hung from hooks from wall to wall. And you would sleep against the rope standing up, like leaning over it. You'd oh. be hanging over the rope. And this is where the term hangover comes from. You'd be drinking too oh. much and you'd be literally <laughs> hanging over this rope. And in the morning, you know, crack of dawn, the owner would unhook it and everybody would crash to the floor, <laughs> the cold, cold Victorian floor and wake up and start their pretty horrible days all over again. <laughs> Oh, I bet those people wish they had just stayed home and cleaned their sink. (laughs) (laughs) Their day would probably get started off much better. (laughs) That's right. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 83. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay, and today we are talking about how we open and close our homes for the day. A few weeks ago, we started to touch on the importance of having routines in our days. From what we've heard in response, this is a topic that resonates with many of us. So this week, we're going to focus in on the two most important times, namely the morning and the evening, and dive into how opening and closing our homes can really help set the tone for a peaceful and orderly day. But first, if you enjoy this episode of the Modern Lady Podcast, would you please take a minute to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast? When we receive ratings and reviews, our podcast becomes more visible and easier to find for new listeners. We would also love it if you shared this episode with your friends. Let us know what you think. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to a dear listener friend who sent us a direct message on Instagram and shared, quote, God's marketing brought your podcast into my life. I was in a difficult season of feeling resentful and discontent in housework. I started to pray a simple prayer. God, please make me enjoy this. This being homemaking and housekeeping. One evening I was scrolling through the Catholic love story hashtag, February seems ages ago now, when I stumbled upon your page and noticed your podcast link. I ended up devouring the entire archive in a week I experienced a paradigm shift and began to fall in love again with caring for my family and home. I've never had a prayer so tangibly answered before. I'm so grateful to you and Michelle for what you do and for the beautiful content you send out into the world. It makes a difference. End quote. Well, thank you so much for your comment, dear listener. We cannot begin to express how grateful we are to you for sharing your message and to the Holy Spirit for such superb marketing and networking on behalf of the podcast. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook or Instagram where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Michelle, I am so excited to say that this is part one of a five-part series on (laughs) the calling card. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So it originated in China in the 15th century and was adopted by the aristocracy in the 17th century and it hit peak popularity in Victorian England. The calling card or visiting card is a beautiful custom that we have lost. Society in Victorian England and throughout the Commonwealth was a very structured institution. There were strict rules that govern society as a whole and then more rules were applied within each class of people. If you were new to a community, it was imperative that you were introduced to quote the right people and this would be aided by letters of introduction. But then the next step would be introducing yourself and that was done with a visiting card or a calling card as they are now more commonly known. Not only used for introduction, these cards were also used to express sympathy or congratulations and for letting people know that you had either arrived in town or were about to depart. There were stringent rules, and while we might look down upon such rigidity, these rules actually helped avoid awkward situations, like having someone pop by unexpectedly who you've never met before. When the Victorian woman would first call on someone, the visit would be almost never face-to-face. 
Sometimes it wasn't even the woman herself who would call. It would be one of her servants who would deliver the calling card. If it were the woman herself, she would arrive in a carriage and fold down the top right corner of the card to let the person know that she was visiting, that it was she herself who dropped by the card, rather than having a servant deliver it. Then she would leave and wait for a reply. If she received a reply in the same manner, a card dropped off with the upper right corner folded down, then a proper face-to-face visit would be arranged. However, if she received back a calling card that was in an envelope, that was an indication that she should keep a polite distance from that person for the time being. The same would be said if she didn't receive back a calling card at all. The style of the calling card was of the utmost importance. It had to be elegant, and there were different rules and designs appropriate for men versus women. The trends changed all the time, and this caused quite a bit of anxiety for the upper classes, who wanted to make sure they were kept abreast of the current calling card fashion. Next week, we will look more closely at the calling card design trends and how these designs were different for men and women. I feel like I would be prone to so much anxiety (laughs) if I was in that kind of high society. I would be angsting over whether or not I was going to receive a calling card back if I went to go (laughs) delivered one. And I don't know what is worse, like our method of reaching out today where people can often see if you've opened your message (gasps) on social media or back in those times sitting there waiting for uh, an unenveloped calling card to come back to you. (laughs) I guess it's been stressful, right? Since the beginning of time, trying to make and maintain friendships. Good point. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. A few weeks ago, Lindsay started sharing on her Instagram account how she has been implementing new routines in her life, somewhat springboarding off of her experience working in a retail store and the opening and closing duties that were required of staff there. I know that I was fascinated at this connection and really curious to learn more. And so as we began to talk more about intention and homemaking, as it specifically pertains to the start and end of each day, we were able to kind of flesh out these ideas a little bit more. Right, Lindsay? Yeah. And I never expected people to care so much, but they really did care about this concept of we having do. kind of... We do. We care a lot. <laughs> I think I was very surprised. But yeah, they, they people loved the opening and closing duties. And so, like you said, I worked in retail management for 11 years. It was just my part-time university job and I ended up loving it so much. It kind of became my career for many years, mm. including the first four and a half years of when I was a mom. Um, So I'm not knocking university or higher education, but in my experience, I learned more practical skills, skills that I have since applied to my everyday life in those years that I worked as an assistant manager in a busy retail store, really more than I ever learned in university. So not only did I learn how to manage people, how to hire and train, how to motivate and discipline people. I learned how to run a store that had many different moving parts, right? It involved like how to plan out the day so that tasks could be completed, that sales could be made, and we had to keep our store looking gorgeous. I also learned how to decorate there and the importance of creating a space that is reflective of your own personal style and how to do that. That's a skill. I helped countless customers figure out what their style is, and it was so much fun helping people decorate their homes for all of those years. I'm really sad to say that after 50 years, Pier 1 Imports did close their doors this year, and Mm. I will always cherish the years and experience I gained from working there. Yeah, I think what was so interesting to me watching your stories of going back and forth with the opening and closing in the store versus in the home Mm -hmm. was like um, at a store, I can see how it would be, you know, less stress and less anxiety having those routines in place Mm -hmm. because you have a faithfulness and accountability to opening and closing. And you have to do it um, like other people's stress levels are contingent on your performance of those duties, Mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of similar to in the home too. Um, And and then at the same time, a difference being that like your heart is not as invested in the same way at Mm -hmm. a store as it is at home. So, you know, in the store you got to decorate, but you didn't maybe have the clutter that you're sentimental Mm -hmm. towards. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Our listeners have heard you and I talk 
a lot about our love of Huga, right? Mm -hmm. When I first heard about Huga back in 2015, it hadn't exploded as a trend yet. And there was only one article about it, which is the only thing I'd read at the time. And it was in a Canadian magazine. And it was just a way to suggest for us Canadians about how we could deal with our long, dark, (laughs) awful winters. And I don't suffer from seasonal affective disorder in the winter. I do in the summer. That's a whole other thing. I hate the summer and it makes me depressed, but I don't in the winter now. (laughs) (laughs) loved ones do. And I started implementing these things, right? The candles, the blankets, all of the things we've talked about. We we actually did an entire episode on Huga in our first season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was groundbreaking for me. And I'm not saying that lightly. Um, We've never since 2015 have stopped actively working towards that every single night in our home. And I recently, okay, so recently, it was just this morning, um, lit a candle in the morning. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Right? And it's like I'm an expert now on the morning routine because I I woke up one morning and lit a candle. But (laughs) let me tell you, (laughs) I loved it. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it stays. It stays as a part of your routine now. Yep. Yeah. Huga has been pretty um, revolutionary to in my family as well. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, you know, we, we talk about candles a lot. <laughs> but as one of our listeners in one of her Insta stories recently said, she's like, actually, it's it's deeper than the candles. It's more <laughs> than the candles. Right. And it, the candles are like the finishing touch on top. But there's a lot of preparation and yes. um, intention that goes towards creating that huga atmosphere. And that's what I have been learning personally in my everyday life more and more is that if the day is ordered towards the lighting of the candle at the night, it's almost like the final step as opposed to, uh, for me, I would just be standing there and, um, you know, after having done nothing else to maybe tidy or organize and I'd light a candle and I'd think, come on, Huga, (laughs) where are you, Huga? (laughs) Yes, yes. And having the a closing routine are those steps that would come and work their way up to the final piece de resistance of um, a, a candle lit ambiance that you're looking for. Another interesting concept similar to Huga is Kuri, and it's from Scotland. Have you heard of this one? Um, I think you told me about it very, very briefly back Mm -hmm. in the day, but no, not beyond that. Well, you know, I'm always on the hunt for the next Tuga so that we can be ahead of the curve. And I thought it would be this one and it never picked up steam, (laughs) but (laughs) I'm still interested in it. And what I actually found so interesting is that this Kuri and that C-O-O R-I-E is defined as a wellness trend. You know, it's kind of like the new agey Mm -hmm. lingo, but when you and I were talking about how these things create a mood, we also realize that the mood doesn't just benefit everybody else, that it is an act of self-care, right? Like we Mm -hmm. also benefit from it. So I get what it's saying with it being a wellness trend. Now, this one though, Kuri, it actually involves being outside as well. So it takes, I guess, some of that, you know, Scandinavian, there's no such thing as bad weather approach as well. And Mm. it just, it's all more about working hard and then playing hard and being outside. So spending your day inside, getting your work done, going out, enjoying the Scottish Highlands, and then you cozy down. So there's the outside elements, and then you come in, you light your candles and you cozy down. And it's just another beautiful idea, but it's just reading these. I, at first I rolled my eyes over the words wellness trend, but I'm like, no, it is wellness. And it does make us feel better. And even more so just like with any gift of giving, right. When we prepare it for other people, we, we reap the benefits back. Mm -hmm. And I like that concept too, about it being a part of wellness, because I've been reflecting lately on how even just the vigor and diligence of going through your day with purpose Mm -hmm. (laughs) and a focus makes me feel better. Like it kind of mitigates that um, uh, maybe desperation that I would have felt more often uh, at the end of the day of needing self-care, the more common uh, trendy 
understanding, if you will, of self-care and just going through the day, like I said, with uh, an intention to perform those duties and to have like a goal at the end of the day and achieving it makes me feel really satisfied and fulfilled going to bed. And it's kind of just been incorporated through the, the tasks of the day that culminates in something that is very curry, if you know. <laughs> well, let's start the tasks of the day. Let's talk opening duties. And and we'll mm-hmm. start by what I remember from my time in retail. And then we will talk about how this can be applied to the home. In retail, we had a, a checklist of opening duties. And this included polishing the floors. And this was with a huge um, buffering machine that was like really heavy and really hard to use. So that would wake you mm-hmm. up in the morning. Um, you had to Windex <laughs> all the glass surfaces. So all the windows, the doors, the mirrors, the tabletops, that sort of thing. You'd go through and turn on the lamps because it was a furniture store. So we'd have lamps. Mm. And then we would have a morning meeting in which we would establish the sales goals and the other goals for the day. Now, what I think is interesting to note is that our sales goal for the day would be dependent on how the store was doing for the week. uh, And then really actually how it was doing for the month and the quarter and so on. And I can't help but draw a connection between how we set those goals in our home as well. And that that we have our yearly goals as our family, monthly, weekly, daily, and as moms, we'll admit to hourly goals, right? Like if I can just Mm -hmm. do this in the next hour, (laughs) in the next five minutes. Um, So we, I think, can all acknowledge that our goals shift and move and they increase and decrease depending on the productivity from the day before the opening, the closing, Mm -hmm. the opening, the closing. So basically the opening duties were meant to ready the staff and the store so that it looked good in order to greet customers. We got the staff pumped up and ready to sell. And we had made sure that they understood things like product knowledge and what sales and promotions were going on and what level of customer service we expect, right? That day we had to go over Mm -hmm. that all the time. Now our expectations were clearly communicated and we checked in on the staff throughout the day. And there was a saying we always said, and I'm might have said it before in the podcast, but it's inspect what you expect. We had to say that as managers. Mm. And I do that at home too. So you can't just set out goals and then come back at the very end of the day. And any mom with young kids knows this, that you can't just tell them to clean their room and then come back at the end and then go, you didn't do it well. Yeah. Like truly what I learned in management is to inspect what you expect. So that means popping in throughout whatever task is going on and making sure they're staying on track. And it really mm. does, instead of coming in at the end and exploding, it does help you stay on track. So Um, I believe, although this all sounds, again, so rigid and business-like, I have had no problem implementing these things with a mother's heart (laughs) into my Mm -hmm. own home. Mm -hmm. Well, this actually reminds me of something... Saint Jose Maria Escriva. Oh. He wants. He he's wants really in. gunning. Yeah, I was he gonna wants, say he's yeah. gunning for the position of patron saint of the podcast here. Yes. But he keeps coming up, and he said something um, that I think is really uh, appropriate to this and framing the concept. He says, "Quote: Put your heart aside. Duty comes first. But when fulfilling your duty, put your heart into it. It helps." Mm. End quote. And I really hear that's uh, in what you're saying. I'm hearing this quote, right? That like yeah. we uh, we do need to get some stuff done. Like it does need to be a little bit um, structured and organized, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be cold and distant and managerial. Like you can do both. They're not mutually exclusive. That's right. Okay, so what does it mean then to open your home for the day? You're not opening a retail store. You're, you are ultimately opening up your home. And you and I both love the history of the home and domestic history. And so the truth is, I mean, the basic duties haven't really changed that much over the millennia. Windows have to be opened, doors unlocked, beds cleaned up. Historically, you woke up in a very cold home, a very, very cold home. Even Mm. in the wealthiest houses, fires were rarely lit because fuel, uh, be it coal or wood, were extremely expensive. So unless you were sick, you rarely actually had a fire lit in your room upon waking up, despite what we've maybe seen in Downton Abbey (laughs) and those Mm. shows. Um, Victorians also believe that people could get deathly ill by breathing in the stale air of their homes. They really thought like carbon dioxide built up. And the Mm. doctors and scientists of the day did recommend sleeping with your windows open, even in the coldest weather, and even in the nurseries where babies slept. 
Now, I guess it's not as crazy when you think back to that they that they had their houses lit with gas lamps, right, and had coal fires burning. There was a lot more in the air, I think, than what we're used mm-hmm. to in our energy efficient homes, uh, with all of their filters and stuff. But yeah, they really believed that you would die if you slept in a room with the windows closed. And so, the average day began at daylight for most people. And the, I mean, it's just simple knowledge that you couldn't work; even the household staff couldn't work in the dark. And they weren't going to waste candles on getting that stuff done. Mm-hmm. In one diary of a household made from the Victorian era, the day started with blackening the range, which was their like coal stoves, lighting the kitchen fire, shaking out the carpets, polishing the dining room furniture, cleaning the boots, scrubbing the front steps. And she had to do all of this before the family woke up. And for those who had to work then in the dark and before the sun rising, which was a, a small group of people, but it was a lot of the men's who worked like in the mines or shift work, they needed a knocker upper. And this is a job and (laughs) that we no longer (laughs) have, but the uh, knocker upper would stay awake all night. And then with the aid of a long stick would wake their customers up by knocking on their windows, right up a story or or Mm. two in their house. Now, I don't know about you, Michelle, but I wake up to the soft opening bars of the Miserere May and it's on my, it's on my iPhone, right? Just gently vibrating on my nightstand. And there was even a period before my Fitbit broke where I was waking up to the little vibrations on my wrist, um, which would happen right in between (laughs) sleep cycles. So I've never had a knocker upper banging on the uh, bedroom window. Yeah, no, I was going to say my alarm clock right now is just static. Oh, it's a, an old radio alarm clock. Yeah. And I just set it to slightly louder static than my fan. So I'm woken up by more white noise. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little terrifying, but yeah, maybe not oh. as terrifying as I think. <laughs> Yeah, not so not so bad. But you know, I was thinking about when you were saying that it was very, very cold Mm -hmm. when they woke up, right? And I just think of how we try to keep our ourselves so warm. Like even um Yeah. Even I love to open the windows and I know we'll get into our um, opening duties in a minute, but Mm -hmm. uh, I won't open the windows until people are dressed because even Mm -hmm. like getting dressed in a draft, I think is uncomfortable. (laughs) And yet these people (laughs) would wake up in like freezing cold weather and have to get going with their day. Yeah. Even in the book I was reading, which is uh, Ruth Goodman's How to Be a Victorian book, she was talking about the fact that most people couldn't even afford a rug to step out onto, onto the ice cold Mm. floor. And that the very least you could do was try to um, sew together from rags a a square, just the size of your feet to step out onto because it was so jarring. Like we can't even understand the cold because we've never been in a house that has no insulation with no Mm -hmm. heating. Like it's just nothing we can even wrap our heads around, I guess, unless you camp in the winter. Um, So yeah, it is a, it is a coldness that we can't even understand. And you're right. And we're like, Oh, I got to crank that heat before I crack the window for a second and make the beds. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, how excited I was that I woke up a whole 45 minutes before my family this morning and Michelle, (laughs) I'm not lying when I say I was Mary freaking Poppins because I was like, (laughs) cheerfully greeting my kids with the nicest voice I've ever used. I handed them warm muffins. I was humming cheerfully as I packed lunches. I even smelled nice based on our etiquette tip from last week. Oh, (laughs) yes. And had a little makeup (laughs) on. And uh, this whole getting up before the children thing, I've talked many times about how I struggle with that, but I can't deny how wonderful Mm -hmm. it is to get up early and get your day going. Yes, I know. I And we've talked about that in the routine episode, but you already know I'm a fan. So mm-hmm. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, our mornings, I think both you and I, not unlike the Victorian servants um, and wives throughout the ages, we still have to feed a family. We still have to open windows. We still have to make beds. Now, there was an argument to be made for actually folding the sheets down and airing out the bed every day. I read mm. that even one hour of exposure of the unmade bed just to the air just so it could dry out would significantly reduce the amount of dust mites in our sheets. <gasps> and I didn't even want to Google more about the tens of thousands of dust mites that we can't see that are in our sheets. Oh, so at least one hour with the open windows can yeah. reduce that. So that's like, all right, get the kids dressed and then open the windows and leave that get going. Yeah. And I would have never really done that before. And so I like the idea of actually folding the sheets down really nicely at the end of the bed, right. And leaving it open for mm-hmm. that hour while you're getting stuff going. Now I'm going to talk a lot about 
beds, right? I love beds. I post a lot about my bed on social media. And I think people can get hung up on this thinking that I'm actually talking about the bed. I, I, I can't yeah. blame them. I did like 25 stories on just how to make my bed the other day. <laughs> But it isn't about the bed. The bed is just part of our daily rhythm, right? It's how I open our day up. I, I love, and this, I'm not being sentimental here. I really love stepping back and looking at the sheets and seeing the imprints made by Jason and I. And, you know, you can see how you've pulled the sheets out over the night. And I love spying a little pillow tucked in when the six-year-old sneaks into our bed half the mm. week. I was going to say, it's not so much about what we do specifically, but it's it's the fact, again, that we just get into a routine that you don't have to get so wrapped up um, or weighed down by the details. It's just mm -hmm. that you, I, the idea of opening your day. Yeah. So for you, it's beds. Mm -hmm. And I, I, though I do make the beds <laughs> later now in the morning that I'm trying to kill dust mites, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd say my opening duty, my primary one would be going around the house and opening up all the curtains mm -hmm. and blinds. Right. To me, it's um, this ties in so much with the closing duties. Obviously, a, a really big closing duty would be going to shut all the curtains again and keep the world out, as yes, it were. Yes. And really kind of um, keeping everything private and closed in on our family. But in the morning, I just want to let all the natural daylight in. And in fact, I very rarely turn on lights during the day I've noticed unless it's a really dark kind of a day um, but just that act of opening up every window I feel like changes the whole appearance of a room and it really invigorates us to get the day going and to start the routines which I talked about in our episode a few weeks ago of getting dressed of going to get breakfast going and things like that it's the daylight that really does something to you know signal to your mind and your body that it's it is time to begin I love that and I've seen you know you and myself and a bunch of people actually this morning it was a beautiful sunrise this morning and a lot of people posted morning photos and it is just so beautiful when you can step back mm -hmm. and see that morning sunlight streeping in it really is um a beautiful reminder again of that it's a new day and we're opening everything up. And when we open our homes up, it is like opening up the store. It readies us to greet the day and to welcome people into our space. And it's just as mm -hmm. much psychological as it is physical. Oh, the greeting. That's such a good analogy with the store mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and a connection to the retail, right? Mm -hmm. Because all the work that you're doing is essentially in preparation to welcome people in like what you're saying um, at a store, if you're not going to be, if the purpose isn't to then greet people yeah. and to en encounter people and meet their what's needs, the point that's right. Then what, what is the point of any that's of the right. other duties that you're doing? Right. That's and right. so too, with our homes, all the little tasks, I know we, we talk about like, it's about the bed, but it's not about the bed. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I think that's probably the best way to describe it is that all these little routines and disciplines and tasks that we busy ourselves with um, throughout the day, but particularly at the beginning and the end of each day is all oriented towards the service. And in the morning, anyways, the greeting of the other people in your house, the other people mm -hmm. in your neighborhood, it, it's you readying yourself to um, greet the world for another day. And then at the end of the day, you need to kick everybody out. You got to close up shop, so right? <laughs> so now travel yes. back with me to Pier 1, right? Now we're an hour okay. away from closing time. And at this time, the staff would work in their zone, their ass assigned area of the store. And they would tidy their entire zone up, working from shelf to shelf, like very detailed from display to display. Every single candle would have to be turned label out and pulled forward so that a solid row was formed. Every item was returned to its proper home. Home, the pillows were fluffed, blankets were folded, and so on and so on. And then the closing manager would walk through about 20 minutes then before the store would close and they would inspect each zone. And if it wasn't tidy enough, it would have to be worked on further. Then the actual cleaning would happen. The bathrooms would be cleaned, the floors swept, and the floors were mopped every single night. And the truth is, that's pretty much how I shut down my house. <laughs> like we do yes. <laughs> the zones, we do a tidy up. I fluff the pillows, right? I refold the blankets. I do an inspection and then I uh, clean bathrooms and floor. Well, I, let's switch it. I don't fully clean the bathrooms at night. I clean the kitchen down and then I mm -hmm. vacuum and clean up the floors. And so, yeah, I, I try as I might to pretend I haven't recreated my pure one life in my house. I kind of have. <laughs> 
Yeah, and see, when you first mentioned closing duties at the store and at the home, all I could think of was (laughs) starting to warn people Mm. at certain increments before closing time (laughs) that it was going to be time to leave soon. And that's what I do for closing duties. I just keep going around. I'm like, okay, 10 more minutes, and then we have to start (laughs) prayers. Okay, five more minutes. Start putting your things away. And (laughs) I would imagine that was also part of the closing duties was to let the people politely know that it is time um, to wind down and set settle in in your home. (laughs) I think you need um, an intercom system, right? Remember, they're so popular in houses in like the 50s and 60s and 80s and and go on and go, all right, sax children, it's your mother. (laughs) Thank you for spending the day here, but it's time we wrap things up. That's perfect. Okay, that's going on the shopping list. Yes. <laughs> for Christmas. Um, I remember years ago, several of my friends were participating in a clean sink challenge. And it was first started by Marla Silly. I don't know how to say her name. Um, mm. She's better known as the Fly Lady. And oh, yes. Yeah. She talked about it in her book. And her book is called Sink Reflections. And <sighs> in an effort to help, help homemakers develop a new cleaning routine, she suggested as one of her baby steps, the challenge of going to bed with a clean sink every night. So it had to be emptied and scrubbed. It was a clean sink and people had to post their photos of their clean sinks. Now, Clean Mama, another very popular social media page, um, also has a clean sink challenge. So it's quite a popular Mm -hmm. idea. And there does seem to be a consensus that having a tidy kitchen sink and a relatively clean kitchen counter does reduce anxiety, especially in the morning when you wake up and walk into that tidy kitchen. It's almost like the final step before you light the candle, Mm -hmm. right? Like, because uh, again, going back to that whole concept of, uh, you know, the ambiance doesn't happen without all of the legwork being done beforehand. The kitchen sink is the closing of the closing duties so that you can relax with the candle afterwards, right? They're almost two different sections of the night. And I, I remember when you were telling me about this this morning, I've, I didn't know that it was a challenge. I didn't realize it was such an intentional thing, Mm -hmm. the sink cleaning. Mm -hmm. I just... I just thought that that was a very natural, like what you're saying, final step to um, after you wash the dishes, you want to just get rid of the soaps um, residue and stuff like that left in your sink. Um, But again, when you attach intention and a renewed focus to these seemingly mundane tasks, they suddenly take on a a more gravitas, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they become really entrenched in your mind and then it really does affect other people too they see that you know it's not about the kitchen sink but it is about the kitchen sink yes and you've established a new ritual that concludes the evening and my mom was the queen of that ritual so my mom was the Mm. type of woman who would clean her kitchen spotless and then she would basically yell the kitchen is closed (laughs) and (laughs) it was closed you know I actually do have fond memories of this like you were just saying like these become when we do things with intention it's so much more than the action and when I reflect back on it and I've talked about this before I find that there's an incredibly romantic Um, aspect to hand washing dishes. And I would watch Mm -hmm. my parents standing side by side. My mom always had dishwashers in her house, never used them. I'm the same way. I finally use it now just because of my kitchen renovation, but I am very anti dishwasher. And Mm -hmm. I would watch my parents standing side by side, washing and drying, and they would have their end of the day meeting, right? They both worked Mm -hmm. full time. So they'd have to catch each other up. And then they would sweep the floor, clean off the counters, prep for the morning, morning um, hustle. My mom, again, worked full time. So she had to prep lunch is she'd have breakfasts cut like she'd have all the grapefruits cut in half and already sectioned and ready to go Mm. wrapped in saran wrap in the fridge and we knew it was closed after she would yell it but then all the lights would be off except for she turned that one little light on over the kitchen sink and you know what it's almost magical to think Mm -hmm. about the dark kitchen with the one little light on and it is beautiful and it's very poignant Mm -hmm. yeah we have the same too i mean Uh, For us growing up, there was lots of fellowship in the kitchen afterwards, Mm -hmm. for sure. But in terms of like the preparation of food and the work of the day, 
like that was it that was done yeah and I like what you were saying about the one little light that's been left on because we do the same thing at our house too Mm -hmm. it's the stove light for us like the range yeah and it is all about lighting in that sense too it's the same thing with candles it's the same thing with lamps they give off a different vibe than overhead lights and you know even how light affects you uh, we talked about the natural daylight invigorating you to get up and work well that soft warm lighting in the evening signals to your mind like it's done now time to rest absolutely lighting is a huge part of design and when we did our kitchen renovation I have four different types of lighting in my kitchen and all four types work independently of each other and all four are on dimmers and that's really Mm. important to me we call it almost like a lighting scape or a light scape to create different levels of dimness throughout the day and if somebody ever has the chance to do that with their lighting in a renovation or a lot of people you can just go buy dimmers and change up your lighting a dimmer oh game changer in a house Mm -hmm. okay so let's say my kitchen is clean I've talked many times before about how committed Jason and I are to doing an entire whole main floor clean we never leave our main floor messy although ever well I've always said it happens maybe two or three times a year it happened last week and it was awful I woke up in the worst Mm. mood it set my day back three hours and I promised myself it's never going to happen again like the working until 11 o'clock at night for me is so worth it to come down to that clean space But after Mm -hmm. we have cleaned everything and we've, you know, watched our episode of Murder, She Wrote or Twilight Zone, um, (laughs) Jason and as with Jason and I move up towards bed, we move from room to room together, securing the house. You know, we check the windows and doors. We make sure the car is locked. We make sure the garage door is closed. And I remember learning about the newly established middle class in Georgian England. These were the first average Joe families that owned their own houses after centuries of renting land from wealthy landowners. They were so protective over their newly acquired houses. They had extensive and rigorous locking up rituals every night in order to secure themselves inside against whatever happened in the darkness. They were very scared of the Mm. darkness. Um, You know, crime was rampant uh, before the Metropolitan Police Force was out patrolling the streets. And it was dark. Like what we were saying with the cold, Mm -hmm. like we can't even imagine. It is a darkness we've never experienced unless you've camped way out in the remote, you know, nowhere. So it's incredibly dark. And people were genuinely scared of the night. There was a lot of superstition. And so this idea of locking everything up was just taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. And as we move up towards bed, I I was reflecting on the history of the bed. And, you know, owning a bed of one's own is such a luxury. And again, we can't even comprehend how lucky we are that we own beds because up until recently, they were pretty awful. They were lumpy Mm. and dirty and uncomfortable. And it's really hard to imagine anyone getting a proper night's sleep. But I suppose if you're working hard from sun up to sundown, right, you'll pretty much crash onto anything. But before there were wooden slats under a mattress, uh, it was actually a grid pattern of ropes and you had to tighten those ropes almost every night so that Mm. the heavy mattress they were stuffed with all sorts of things those mattresses um so it wouldn't collapse into the middle so you had to tighten the ropes which is where the saying sleep tight originated from oh oh i love that Mm -hmm. and then one final thing we always love to do is to go and just check on the people Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and we walk through together again we we go through together and just check on each room and um see that the the kids are okay yeah. and that they're settled is their room too too warm is the room too cold very not <laughs> georgian time problems <laughs> <laughs> for us i guess um but just making those final little adjustments um going into the long um the long night ahead and making sure everyone is still provided for even though those people are sleeping like the opening and the closing duties um though they are similar to the store concept, they have that added heart element where it is all about the service of the other people living right within your homes. And that's where I, I feel like the difference is, but that's where the the home is where the heart is. And it's maybe not necessarily in retail. So I think you're right. And I love that the way we open and close our houses every day speaks volumes about what's going on inside of our homes at that time. Our morning routine does set the tone for the whole day. And our evening routine is a reflection of our mood that day of what we accomplished of what was left undone. Jason and I often stand with his arm around me looking out at our front window for a few moments after we lock the front door. 
We look out onto the silent street and call to mind just how much this little house means to us. We take a minute to share in the gratitude. We feel it together. And we believe that we show how much we feel this gratitude by how much we value and take care of this home and the items in it. I can understand how those early middle class homeowners felt in Georgian England. While I don't fear the dark like they did, I do grasp the importance of securing my home and protecting the people and the hard earned belongings inside of it from a world that will never truly care about us like we care about each other. These daily rituals of opening up our homes and readying ourselves to face the world and then doing our duty throughout the day and the daily rhythms of shutting everything down, of practicing huga, is clearly universal and timeless. It's not just about how well you make the bed or how well you scrubbed the sink. It's about creating a morning and evening routine that not only opens and closes your home for the day, but also readies your heart to face the world beyond your front door. And it reminds you that you always have control over when you close that door to the world, to cozy down as a family and to feel safe as darkness falls. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? I can't get enough of the Donna Reed show. Um, I have loved Donna since I first saw her in It's a Wonderful Life and now watching Mm. her as Mrs. Alex Stone. Oh, I just can't stop watching. Um, The show premiered in 1958 and it ran for eight seasons ending in 1966. The show was ahead of its time because I guess most of the sitcoms at that time focused on the father of the family. Um, And while her husband, who's a pediatrician, Dr. Alex Stone, who's pleasant to look at, um, does have a large (laughs) role on the show. Donna really does feature prominently. And the actor who played their son, Jeff, once said that Donna Stone is pretty much the same person as Donna Reed, the actress, that she really was as effervescent, immaculate, Mm. and pretty in real life as she was on the show. Now, in real life, Donna Reed was the mother of four. She had two biological children and two that she had adopted as her older two children. And her portrayal of a housewife on the show, it spanned for 275 episodes and it was hailed Mm. by many as a big step forward for women. It was one of the first storylines that was told by a woman that wasn't a soap opera. In a 1964 interview, Donna Reed said, quote, we have proved on our show that the public really does want to see a healthy woman, not a girl, not a neurotic, not a sex pot. I am so fed up with immature sex and stories about kooky, immoral, sick women. (laughs) So... We wow. have the Donna Reed show. Um, so while I do find the kids on the show actually to be a little bit ruder than um, what I'd expect mm. or what I'd like, overall, I really like the family dynamic and I really, really like the marriage between Dr. and Mrs. Stone. Um, the icing on the cake is her wardrobe. You can just Google it. And I love seeing all the dresses and pretty nightgowns. And she is just a stunning woman to watch on the screen. You just, you'll be captivated. Mm-hmm. Well, like you, I love her in mm-hmm. It's a Wonderful Life. Mm-hmm. And it it sounds like that's essentially her character. Yeah. <laughs> in the Donna Reed show, it's too. True. Okay. Yeah. That's just who she is. Like, I Right. Really, yeah. And I don't know, maybe we'll do a her story on her one day in the future oh, because yes. I think there's just so much more about her I'd like to know. But yeah. So what have you been loving this week? Okay, so we're taking a little bit of a turn here. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm about 20 years behind on this one, but I have finally watched Minority Report. <laughs> yes, that movie starring Tom Cruise. So after suggesting The Lady Vanishes last week, I've realized that I'm just simply on a mood, in a mood for uh, psychological thrillers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I've been filling my to be watch lists with them. And one thing I love about this movie and really the whole genre of, you know, that whole dystopia, sci fi, psychological thrillers is that it really makes you question deep issues, mm-hmm. but through the medium of entertainment, right? So like in this movie, uh, I really feel like the whole theme is, does the end justify the means? Mm -hmm. And that's really the question that you ask yourself throughout the whole movie. And of course, like, according to my faith and principles, like, I believe that the end does not justify the means. (laughs) (laughs) always. Um, But watching the trope play out in entertainment is was still a really good reminder that it can be tempting to sacrifice morals and standards, especially when you think the results is going to benefit in the long run. Mm -hmm. 
So anyways, I didn't mean to get all philosophical there, <laughs> especially about a Tom Cruise movie of all things. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> um, just, you know what, just a note though, in case you haven't seen it either, or you maybe haven't seen it in a while, like there are some rather intense and mature scenes that c- came up that caught me off guard. So just keep that in mind, but otherwise a really great storyline and um, a lot of food for thought. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or leave us a comment on Facebook or Instagram where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at MM Sachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Hellmaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and we will see you next time.